Hey everybody, Jerome Maldonado, and we are, it's Wednesday, Real Talk on Real Estate. So we're going to try this again. I think I was just live. Someone let me know that my audio wasn't working. We're going to restream from the beginning. So inflation, this is one of the big topics right now. It's at an all-time high. They're, expe um, they're expected to see another 7% inflation, uh, inflationary market in 2022. How does that affect us? Is this going to be the cause of us going into recession? And is the Federal Reserve going to be able to make necessary changes to be able to help stabilize the market and not put us into a recession and not create mass hysteria. Now, typically what lands up happening is that the Federal Reserve, cool, thank you, Trey, the Federal Reserve will come in and they'll start increasing interest rates to be able to stabilize inflation. Now, the big question is, have the Feds waited too long to be able to stabilize inflation? And have we went overboard? Now, are they gonna have to go so aggressive raising interest rates that it's going to stick us into a recession. And that's the big talk with economists right now is where are we in regards to our economics and being able to go into a recession. So some strategists say right now that it's a coin toss. And here's why. Um, and for both of you guys who are investors, you guys are looking at buying uh, and buyers just trying to move into a house. It's important that you guys understand how our money system works in our government, the Federal Reserve, politically and um, in between uh, parties, Democrats, Republicans. And so ultimately, I think that people really just wanted to see Trump out of office, you know, um, love or hate him. But it was the Dem I think the Democratic people wanted to see him out of presidency. So I honestly feel that what's happened currently was that the Democrats wanted to see inflation. Otherwise, why would they have really shut down the Keystone Pipeline? I mean, we take a look at what's happening. Everybody is, uh, is blaming the war with Russia on Ukraine as to why we're everything's getting inflated and that's why gas prices are high. I, I want to call their bluff and I want to say that I think that's bullshit because I, I truly believe that it is. Um, I, you know, we were already at this point of inflation prior to the war on uh, against Ukraine. Um, the Keystone Pipeline understand that we have enough crude oil right here in the United States to not have to import any from any place else in the world. And not only that, they said it was an environmental deal. OK, now I will tell you guys, if you do actual research on the Keystone Pipeline, you will find that there is less environmental impact from the Keystone Pipeline than there is from wind turbines and other sources of energy. So understand there is more money that's put into environmental protection, environmental research, running those pipelines than any other sector of environmental um, well-being in, in any other sector across the world. And so there is so much money that's put into environmental care with that Keystone Pipeline. There's almost zero discharge of free radicals and, uh, and discharge into our ground soil. So almost there's almost zero impact, very, very little. And so why would they really shut it down? Well, I think that the Democrats really wanted to see inflation. Now, why would they want to see inflation? Well, typically when there's inflation, they, they, they print money. When they print money, what happens is it stimulates the economy and it drives it drives prices up. Now, there's a, a balance here. So the feds have sit back. The coronavirus kind of altered this a little bit. And now they have a little bit of a balancing act to play. If they don't play this balancing act right, yes, it can't put us into a recession because if they didn't raise interest rates too quick and now the American people cannot afford to buy, guess what happens? The buying power stops. People can't buy houses. Think about what the number one asset class is in our country. OK, now think about your parents. Think about yourself. Think about your grandparents. What is the number one largest asset that they own? It's a single family home. And so when you think about it in, in terms of most people, the average median people, not, I'm not talking about investors. I'm not talking about affluent people. I'm not talking about people that are buying rental homes try, that are ambitiously trying to, to create more for themselves. I'm talking about the average working class uh, family. If you take a look at it from that standpoint, what lands up happening is you look and see and realize that the housing market is their number one asset of the American people. The second is automobile industry. So for those of you guys who are sitting back and you're, you're going, okay, I, I want to go out and buy a new home or I want to buy a car. What happens with inflation is inflation, when it, when it goes up too much, people stop spending. And the problem with that is less spending means they don't, they're not out in the marketplace. So our economics slow down. So what are they doing with their money? They're saving it. 
And so when inflation goes up too much, there, there's not as much spending going on and more, more money is going into those bank accounts. Now, what ends up happening is when the housing market slows, the problem with that is that all other sectors of, of uh, retail and buying slow down. Because think about it. When you buy a house, what else do you need with that house? You need landscaping. If you need, um, you're going to need curtains. You're going to need furniture. You're going to need food, right? You're going to need, you, you stock this house up with all of the day, day in, day out uh, needs that, that, that you have for that house. There's going to be a list of other vendors and retailers that start to slow down simultaneously with housing. We saw this in 2007. We saw this in 2008. And we saw this all the way through the recession. Now, if you look at interest rates, if you look at inflation right now, we're in an all-time high over 40 years. This didn't happen. This hasn't happened to this magnitude since 1981. Then the feds went in, they started raising interest rates and it tanked the stock market, tanked us economically. And, um, and so we ran into a recession back in the 80s. So we, the same thing kind of happened in 2007. Uh, now, financially, we're sitting in a different place right now because there's over $2 trillion currently in the market that, ha that, that, that households, individuals like you and I currently have on our books. We have over $2 trillion in savings. So currently, with that $2, that $2 trillion in savings, we're not going to see a, us go into a recession in 2022, more than likely. Now, maybe towards the tail end, we'll start noticing changes economically. But if we don't start making some changes with the way interest rates are so we can slow inflation, and if if they don't, if the feds don't balance this, this act of interest rate inflation, if this interest rate increases with inflation, then the market is definitely going to teeter-totter and we're going to hit a, a, a recession, no doubt about it, okay? Now, because we have a lot of padding in, as U.S. people in our pockets right now, it's a good thing, right? Because with $2 trillion of savings in the U.S. pockets of Americans just like you and I, uh, people have a little bit of reserve to be able to go out and offset it. Here's the problem, though, is that with that reserve, now with inflation, it's more of all of our utilities, our, our um, energy bills are going up, all of our crude oil. So at the pump, we're seeing inflation and we're spending all of this excess reserve that we had as savings now to live and maintain. And it's going back in all artificially into these um, inflationary markets that we don't want to utilize. We don't want to go spend more for gas. We want to go use that money to go take a cruise or buy a car or go buy that new um, electric car, that new Corvette or that new watch you always wanted. Right. So we, we don't have that luxury if the, if inflation continues, because just to maintain life, just to go out. And if you go to the grocery store now with commodities, they've gone up in price. So just to get groceries, gas, um, to heat your home, to cool your home. Now we're starting to see that money evaporate economically. OK, so that's what ends up happening. So if you guys have questions on any of this stuff, as we're walking through this video. Feel free to ask and I'll, I'll kind of run through it with you. Now, inflation. Anytime there's inflation, the Fed raises interest rates to bring down inflation, and then it drives down it drives down um, inflation. Typically, now the reason they do that is because the dollar bill gets stronger when they bring when when the interest rates go up and there's an inflation drops, the dollar bill gets stronger. Problem with inflation is if they continue to pump money, things continue to get expensive, the dollar bill vanishes and it becomes almost worthless. And if you take a look at companies like Germany or Zimbabwe, where they printed a ton of money and inflation continued to go up exponentially over the last couple of years, you'll see that historically, anytime there's mass inflation where economically you can't control it, the dollar bill gets devalued and it's worth almost nothing. So we want, we want to protect the dollar bill here in the United States. Now, the problem with our dollar bill is this. Nixon in 1971 took it off the gold standard. So basically gold and silver are, the, are were really only one of the real currencies. I always say that real estate is a real currency because no matter whether there's a recession or not, over time, the real estate will appreciate in values. Although we're seeing just ex exponential inflation in real estate right now, it's going to dip. It will dip. But then over time, it'll slowly start to climb. Here's, here's an example. Okay. Now, I think... Those of you guys watching can agree with me that in 2006, we were pretty wasteful as Americans. So for those of you guys who are mature enough to remember 2004, 5, 6, and 7, 
and, and realized what was happening in the market, everybody was a real estate professional. And so when you go to the dentist and the person cleaning your teeth is talking about being a real estate professional, or you go down to the, to the grocery store and the guy sacking your groceries is telling you about Bitcoin investing and real estate, there's a problem. Because ladies and gentlemen, when everybody becomes a professional in it, that's where you need to turn and run. And so if you remember in 2006, seven, uh, five, six, seven, and eight, everybody was, was a real estate professional, okay? And what landed up happening is when the market, when they pulled the carpet out from underneath us in 2007, um, those people who didn't really know the game, they lost. And so things were, were inflating exponentially at that time. And interest rates started to go up a little bit. And then all of a sudden the recession hit and the wool was pulled out from underneath our, uh, underneath our feet. And so when you take a look at like the gold standard and you take a look about at inflation and you take a look at, at printing money, you know, a lot of what's happening in the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve, it's ran by our central banking system, not our federal government. It's, it's a non-governmental agency. Most people don't realize that, it, that it's ran by our central banking system. And so what ends up happening is when they go in and they try to adjust interest rates, there's, there's, it's called quantitative easy. OK, so. We were printing over $120 billion every single month back in the, the, the beginning of the fourth quarter of 2021. OK, so $120 billion every month was getting printed in September, October. And then in November, they sat back and said, you know, we're going to reduce this. We're going to go back and we're going to do some quantitative easing and we're only going to produce $30 billion and we're going to slowly taper this to $15 billion. Then they expedited it. And in December, they said, you know what? No more printing. We're not going to print any more money. So now we go back in and in January, we sit back and they, they started what's called quantitative tightening. OK, now I'm going to try to explain this to you guys in layman terms. But don't let me lose you here because this all has to do with real estate investing and where our, our economy is going. Because the what's happening, the media is lying to you guys right now. And they're trying to make you guys believe that things are, are just fine. Now, things are just fine for the time being. But you need to know if you're investing in real estate, how this affects you and how this is going to continue to move and migrate in this, in this uh, direction. We are heading towards a recession or a market um, compression, however you want to see it at some point in time. So the way we buy real estate is very, very important. Now, they're sitting back and they, you may be looking at this going, okay, what, Jerome, is quantitative tightening? Well, quantitative tightening is when, is when we, the, the feds actually destroy money. And so if you're sitting back, you're going, wait, if the feds actually destroy money, why would they do that? Why would they print all this money just to destroy it? Well, they print money because Assets rise when anytime there's printing going on of money. So if you take a look at last year, printing money, $120 billion a month, $120 billion a month. What was happening to all our assets? Real estate was going through the roof, right? The average single family home went from $200,000 to $360,000. The loaf of price for the loaf of bread went up. Our prices at the tank went up it, um, to put gas in our cars. Everything slowly started creeping up. Lumber, building materials, everything starts started going up. Now, when they start to destroy money, why would they do this? Okay, well, here's what happens. I don't know if you guys remember me doing a video when I was talking about typically when there's so much inflation and if, if the market teeter-totters and they start um, in raising interest rates, people start buying bonds. Why? Because when interest rates rise, typically the stock market plateaus and even drops, okay? So what typically happens is, is if you go, if interest rates go up too fast, the feds tank the market and we, it, it pushes us straight into a recession because everything happens, uh, like the economy shrinks, stocks drop and um, consumers start to save instead of spending and jobs are lost. And, and right now wages are full. So we have to watch this. Now, what happens with quantitative tightening when they destroy money is people say, how does that work? Well, here, here's how quantitative tightening works. People buy bonds and when they mature, they typically roll over. Now, when the, when the feds destroy them is the fed, when the, they go in and the feds actually sell off the bonds. Okay. And then when the feds sell off the bonds, 
the feds don't roll over the bonds anymore because they belong to somebody else because they belong to somebody else. So when the feds actually sell off these bonds who no longer, they no longer own and they, they belong to somebody else and they mature. Well, when at full maturity, they don't roll over anymore. The feds, when they sell them, they get the money back, but the feds don't need the money. If they need more money, they can just print more of it. They just hold on to it because they really don't have a place to put the money. So then they pull all that money back in with this bond from, from the selling of the bonds and it destroys the money. So there's six trillion dollars out there, but the more bonds that are sold and that and the more bonds that mature, the more the more money is getting destroyed by the feds. But most people don't realize that. And so what happens is when money is destroyed, asset prices actually drop. And so along with everything that's happening with interest rates, as they start rolling over these bonds and they start selling these bonds in a full maturity, they don't have any play displacement for this money. And the feds hang on to this money. Guess what happens to our assets? They drop in value. So for those of you guys who are waiting for a market compression and are waiting to be able to take advantage of great buys, this is a great time. And so for those of you guys who are sitting back going, should I wait and buy? This is a great time to sell right now because we're still at a market high. So what we're doing is we're still we're still buying land. We're still building houses. We're still buying land and building apartments. Now, our business model is slightly different. And I've been talking about this for a long time because I remember going into 2007, building retail centers and office complexes, thinking that I was untouchable from a market uh, contraction and a recession. I never lived through one. I, I remember starting my business in the late 90s after a small market correction, but there was only one way, there was only one direction after a recession, and that's to move up. So for those of you guys who are sitting at the top of your game right now and you're thinking, I'm, in, I'm inevitably um, extinct from all of this, I'm not going to be affected by it at all, you may want to think again. So the way we've been doing this, and I've been talking about our business model as far as buying land and building houses, I say don't get into the median home. And the reason why is because if you get into the median single family home, those are the people that are making median incomes. You need to be just above that. People that when there's market compressions, they don't really get affected by the fluctuation in the market because they have fixed incomes. People like our parents, people like our grandparents, people that have a little bit more affluency. So we're looking at just over the mean, the upper middle class, the people that don't really get affected by market compressions. Now, you sit back and you, and you take a look at that. That's a great business model because we still have profitability. So right now, we're making more money on single family homes than we ever have historically. I would In the asset class that we build in, we've never, we never make over $135,000 on a single family build. Um, in the market sector, in the market class that we actually build in, with the exception of what we do in Washington state, because the affluency is greater there. So if you're in a more affluent area, I'm talking about the average mean of, of real estate. And it, this is going to be dependent demographically to where you are, but we typically make about 135,000. Well, now we're making closer to $200,000 on every single house that we build. So if I sat back and realistically feel like I'm going to stick there forever and I'm always going to be making $200,000 on every single family home that I make and I bank on that, I'm going to be vastly disappointed and you will be too. And so realistically, I sit back and say, okay, we have, let's, let's take these gains like a grain of salt and let's bank them and let's invest them in something that's going to grow in spite of my efforts. But let's not bank on these forever. So I tell people, if you're going to get into the housing market, don't be fixed and flipping right now. Don't be buying shit at inflated prices, expecting for the market to continue to rise. Because if you do, you're going to be um, extremely disappointed when it comes 2023 or 2024. And no, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't promise you that that's going to happen, but I can promise you this. Something's going to happen. There's going to be some economic changes. It's inevitable right now. More than ever, we've seen so much changes economically and we're at such a stimulated economy and inflation is so high. Something has to give, right? Something has to burst. And so knowing that, I could sit here and mislead you and tell you that everything's going to be fine, but that's not the case. So I can realistically tell you, look, what if we have a 10%, 15% compression? You're making $200,000 on that on, on that house traditionally, and the market compresses, and you've paid all these inflated values to be able to build out that house. Well, are you guys okay if it compresses 20% and you only make $100,000 building that house? I'm okay with that. 
because that's what I underwrite these deals to do. So I'm okay making less because that's what we've made historically. So if I only go in and make 80, 100, 120,000 as opposed to $200,000, it's still a win for us. Our profitability continues to grow and we're still moving in a positive cash flow um, scenario. Now, for fix and flippers, this is where I caution you guys right now. For those of you guys who are buying big asset class value add properties, this is where I caution you guys because what's going to happen is interest rates are going to rise. There's going to be people that purchased assets at a three and a half percent cap rate going in, expecting to do value add, adding value to it and pushing rents. Now, when they push rents, the values go up and the value of the asset goes up and then the cap rate also goes up with it. Problem is we've had all these rent pushes, push, push, push. So even if we don't even get a depression, but they just halt and you're at 3.5%, um, if you're at 3.5% cap rate, now you want to go refinance that property. But now interest rates are higher. And so you go back and you have a, a three and a half, four percent interest rate. And now you're going to refinance that thing at a 5% interest rate. Here's where the problem comes in. Because now you're sitting back, you have investors in a deal. Those investors want to return. But you can't refinance to get the investors out because if you do, you're going to have to be servicing debt on top of your cap rate because your, your properties are not making the money that you once that, that you once thought you were going to make because you bought it at, at too low of a cap rate. And now when you go refinance, the interest rate's higher than your cap rate. So now you have to service debt. That's called trash can money. That money's going in the trash. So the problem is, is how do you offset that? Well, the banks go in, you can't make the payments, and now your, your, your property is getting financially distressed because you can't afford to do the value add because you can't afford to refinance. Now you can't afford to get investors out. Now that's a big problem. So now you're pressed to sell. And so these properties get sold off short for a, um, a discounted price. That's where buyers come in, in a compressed market. Now you're getting discounted prices on premium real estate. Now you go in, you buy that at an eight cap, six cap, seven cap, whatever it is, refinance it. Now you can do your value add. Okay. But you can't do it when you over leverage yourself. That's the reason that we've been building real estate. We've been building it because we can build it. We can walk into these with a 14, 15 cap from day one. We don't underwrite them at a three and a half percent cap rate. We underwrite them at a 5% cap rate. And even if we land up at a 6% cap rate with the with the ROI that we have, we're at a better place. So people ask me, Jerome, are you going to continue building these assets? And the answer to you is no, I'm not going to. Why would I build an asset when I can buy one at some point in time at a discounted price with less work, a lot quicker to be able to make the same returns? And so there's a little pivot in our business model that'll shift at some point in time. But right now, it still makes more sense to build, even if the um, inflated cost to build. And the reason why is because we can walk in with so much equity being the builder, developer and the investor than we can because assets are still trading at historical highs. We're, they've never traded at, at the prices that they, that they traded for right now. So we're still patiently waiting. We're building out, finishing off some of our builds and our assets over the next year, two years, and we'll sit at a good place. Why? Because we built them for a market compression. We built them expecting the worst. The reason we built them expecting the worst is because we knew something like this was going to happen. So instead of going out and building a class A property with the swimming pools, the big gyms, the big uh, clubhouses, all the little um, stay at home offices and all the assets and all the uh, amenities that go along with that asset, the little croquet places, in there, like who in the hell plays croquet at their apartment complex? You ever seen any of that stuff, that shit ever used? The answer is no. No one uses it. You even go to a gym with 350 doors, you'll see one or two people in there at peak hours. Very rare, very few um, amenities ever get utilized. It's just a great selling point when people are going in and they're buying and they're uh, and they're leasing these things. And so they sell you, they market it to you. But the reality is they don't get used. So what do we do? We strip all that garbage out of our builds and we build a damn nice apartment complex. But because our build cost is so much lower than building out with all those stupid amenities, we can lease our properties and compete with class B real estate being not class A, not the highest of all high, beautiful real estate. We can compete with a class below that stuff that was built in the 90s, stuff that was built in the early 2000s, stuff that has lower lease rates. But which would you rather be in? I'd rather be in the new asset as opposed to a, 19, a, two, a 1999, 2005 asset. I'd rather be in a 2022 asset that's beautiful, new, clean, and have the same lease rates as if I was renting something that was built in 2005 with very little value add. So we've already 
underwrote these projects to be able to do well, but we can refinance them. We can pull cash out on them. Even if the banks, um, if they compress on us and they don't even want to refi, we'll just sit on them and we'll just lease. No big deal. Our houses, Airbnb market, Great market. We'll just sit back and do short term rentals. We'll make more money doing that if we need to. But I'll tell you that even in 2007 and 8, in the asset class that we build in, just over the median, our worst our worst profit was uh, $43,000. And that was partially my fault because I built the kitchen wrong and I had to spend $15,000 renovating the kitchen. I would have made probably about fifty-five dollars to $60,000, which the other house, I kind of um, I kind of shit canned it. And said, you know what? The recession is here. Oh, my God. What am I going to do? Let's just sell these things. And I started selling them. So discounted. I shouldn't have done that. But I just wanted to get cash back in our bank accounts. So I wanted and we were building cash. So I wanted the entire amount of cash out of that house. And we still made $48,000 on that one. Those were the two worst sales that we ever had. So then I said, OK, reframe this stuff and let's go back at it. And then we cut our cost down, which is what's going to happen because with interest rates going up, inflationary prices are going to slowly come back down. So in two years from now, you'll sit back and say, Jerome, there's no there's no market for housing. See, yeah, there is. You just have to build out the right asset class. So as things start to drop, now you can build the exact same asset for more for less money and you restructure the amenities that are going into those. And we see what's trending at that time. You stay with what's trending. You give people a little bit more for their money. You put the, reinvest that back into what people, what's trending. And then you sell for a profit. You may not make, be making $200,000 or $150,000, but you might be making eighty dollars to $100,000. And then you have a slow climb out of that hole, a slow climb out of that hole. So you, you turn one for 80,000, then one for 85,000, then 90,000, then 95, then 100, then 120. And then all of a sudden in three years from now, you're making $135,000 every single bill and pushing that stuff back into value add properties one after another. So at some point in time, sooner than later, we're going to stop building the assets and we'll start buying the assets discounted. And it will happen. You watch my you you watch what happens. Mark my word as God is my witness. I promise that stuff will start to evolve in that direction. So Tyler's asking, I'm uh, build my own houses. OK, I'm build my own houses. I got seven years of framing, roofing, drywall. Well, Trey, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Tyler. I'll tell you that right now is a great time. Continue building. Just do it some wisely. Um, you know, we're making modifications right now with inflation. So OSB, which is ply, is particle wood. Um, we found at CDX, which is plywood, typically more expensive. We're able to get it for a little less money. So we moved to CDX. Then I sat back and said, you know what? Back in the 90s, we were, we were framing these houses with gypsum board, drywall board. And so we're able to save about $15,000. No, I'm sorry, $12,000. On our dry on our lumber package by using gyps chip board, same quality, but it's less expensive. And so we're just modifying how we build. And so one of the great things about working with people that understand this stuff is you get to learn that stuff from our experience and our headaches that we had 10, 15, 20 years ago, as opposed to going through it today on your own. So nonetheless, um, if you guys like the content, the material that we're going over, pound that like button, subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content. That way you're notified anytime I'm talking about topics just like this. But give us a thumbs up and pound that like button. Now, now look, we are going to move into a recession at some point in time. Now, how bad that recession is going to be, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. All I know is that anytime the, the Fed start to increase um, interest rates and we have such high inflation, they're not going to have this is it's not going to happen perfectly so it, during monetary policy what you guys got to remember is that it takes time and monetary policy it works with a lag time and so we won't know the effects of that interest rate hike until a few months from now and so as we start having multiple interest rate hikes that could be a six month lag and then all of a sudden the, the the feds go oh shit and they have that oh shit factor and said damn we raised interest rates too quick too high and now we just shit caught can the economy but for those of you guys who are sitting back you might be sitting back going that's a bad thing and as, as much of, as you may think it's a bad thing it may really be a good thing in hindsight why because inflation is going through the roof right now as inflation goes through the roof our dollar bill becomes worth less money and so to be able to protect the us dollar bill and protect our assets long term maybe a recession is not the worst thing that could happen right now and so sit back think about it for a minute you know we've been planning for this we've been investing for this so i'll sit back and i'll tell you guys that this may not be a bad thing 
this could be a good thing for those of you guys who've been wanting to get into the into the real estate market. People always think the right time to get into the real estate market is is at a time when things are at the highest peak. They think, wow, high values. I'm going to make a ton of money. Wrong. When you make the most money in real estate is when the market compresses and it shit cans and it gets rid of all the garbage things. There's discounted prices. You buy those assets at discounted prices and then you just ride the wave up, ladies and gentlemen. Problem is we don't know when the bottom hits. We don't know when they pull the rug out from underneath us and they, we don't know exactly when, when the bottom is actually going to hit rock bottom. So what you do is you continue to buy all the time. And through that bell curve, you're going to, the only way you lose is if you can't hold your assets. So if you listen to anything that I'm saying, everything that I'm talking about, I talk about bu building, developing and buying for the worst, but scale for the best. And so if you sit back and you hit the right asset classes and you understand how money works, inflation works, interest rates work, and you understand how the Federal Reserve work, which is a non-federal agency, it's bullshit. And um, they, Nixon took our, our dollar bill off the gold standard in 1971. So now our dollar bill ain't even worth a shit no more. It's just a piece of paper. And so back before um, Nixon took it off the gold standard, they, they'd only print so much money because it was it only held the value of gold. And so when gold it is really one of the only true currencies, and I would say real estate is also one of the only true currencies because over time, historically, real estate will continue to go up. Now, I'm going to end with this because this is cool. Now, if you don't believe me that that real estate always continues to go up, I take a look at 2007. I remember going down and doing and, and looking at deals and trading real estate for what I thought was an all time high. And you guys did, too. If you guys were lived through this part of the uh, this part of the world when the recession hit in 2008. Now, I remember going back into 2009, 2010, my wife and I go down to Laguna Beach and we're looking at distressed assets that are oceanfront right off of PCH Highway. Assets in 2006 and seven were selling for about $1,100 a square foot, $1,100, $1,150. Prime real estate right on the ocean. Just class A, beautiful real estate right on the ocean, $1,100, $1,150 a square feet, right in the village of Laguna Beach, right on PCH Highway. Okay, highest, highest that it's, it had ever been. 2009 comes around. We're out there devouring, looking at real estate. It dropped to $600 a square foot for prime real estate. We sat back and said, holy shit, this is awesome. So we buy a property and we own that property and we ride the wave up. And I tell my wife, once that property gets close to $1,100 a square foot, we need to get out of it. And the reason why is because there is no way I told her that the prices are going to go up over $1,100 a square foot because that's what got us in the uh, in, in the economic situation that we were in because things were so overpriced, right? So at about $950 to $1,000 a square foot, I sat back with my wife. I said, you know what? Let's sell this damn thing. Let's get rid of it. And we made some money. We made a lot of money on it. We made a couple, a few million dollars on that thing. So I sat back and I said, let's sell it. Those exact same properties today, lo and behold, they're worth over $1,600 a square foot. So what I thought was high was not even close to high. Imagine if I still own that real estate today. You know, I would have made an extra, I don't even remember the square footage of the house. I want to say it was like 2,700 square feet times, shit, man, $600 a square foot. I would have made another, I'd have made $16 million on that thing. No, I'm sorry, $1.6 million. I made $1.6 million more, more than I did. I made $1.6 million more than I did. So understand that what's going to happen is the market's going to decline. Assets are going to go down and then slowly they're going to climb back up. So for those of you guys who are in real estate and you're sitting back going drunk, you're scaring the shit out of me. Don't be scared. Just this is just not a, a time to start refining. If you're going to refinance, refinance now before interest rates rise. Sit your, set yourself up in a position where you can hold that real estate for a duration of time and then go to work, stay focused on new assets and buying distressed assets and just let your real estate hover. Let it cash flow. Let it pay you. Just let it hover. Forget about it and go back to work. And then over the course of the next three, four, five years, as, as we bottom out in the recession, we slowly start to climb up. Then you can just watch your, your values appreciate over the course of the next decade. And that's how you get wealthy, ladies and gentlemen. And you're going you're gonna to have big gains with the stuff you buy now as the market declines. Not right now. Wait for a little bit. We're not there yet. I'm just talking perspectively as we move into 2023, 2024. You'll watch. Just keep following our content. You will see how I modify and shift my business model. I was just on the phone with a buddy of mine today that just exited one of his companies. And I, I sat back and I told him, look, 
Brandon, we're going to go back. We're going to we're going to hit this market sector slightly different than we talked about even 60 days ago, because this is what I believe is happening right now with um, with the feds. This is what's happening with inflation. This is what's happening with um, economists and where we they're projecting things to go. And so we need to take these asset classes down slightly different. Um, so Tyler, join my inner circle. I'll, I'll answer all those questions for you as far as your personal home and stuff. And I can help you save and make a shitload of money um, doing it. I'll explain to you our exact business model and how we do it. We have a ton of people that are working with us that are that are turning these assets and generating capital from building houses right now. Um, really, really cool. Um, anyways, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on Wednesday's Real Talk on Real Estate. If you haven't already, pound that like button, subscribe to our YouTube channel so you're notified for more content just like this. And if you haven't already seen my prior videos talking about inflation, you're going to want to see them. I go into a little bit more depth, a little bit different content to help you better understand what's happening economically and what economist projections are. I go back and I do a ma mass research on what the National Association of Home Builders is doing and how economists are moving forward. Um, big companies like Blackstone and, and as, as all these other companies and big investment reefs are making modifications and changes. The big builders like DR Horn, Pulte, LGI Homes and all these other guys, you're going to want to know what's happening and what these big guys are doing. So don't forget to click and watch one of our other videos. We'll put a link either up, up above, down below or to the side. Click that link, watch those other videos, and I'll see you guys next week on Wednesdays, Real Talk on, on Real Estate. Thank you guys for watching. God bless and have yourself a great day. See you next week. Hey, thank you, Anthony. Appreciate you, brother.